Welcome to Citizens Forum. Uh, my name is Walt McGinnis, and uh, to start off the show today, we're going to uh, do our segment called the Walt and Jack Show, and we like to talk about things that have happened over the last couple of weeks and other events that we'd like to explore a little more fully. So welcome to the show, Jack. Thank you, Walt. And so what have you brought in for us today? Well, I got this from Medi. Um, okay. And it's a transcript from, it's about proportional representation. Um, and this is what I think. I think the corporations don't want proportional representation because it is more democratic. It gives the people a little more power, not a lot, but at least a little. Yeah. And it takes a little power away from the people who run the country, which is the 1% who own the media. So this is from CFAX. Uh, on the morning of September 28th, around 11.45 a.m. And it's Adam Sterling, and he's, he's doing a call-in about proportional representation. So this is what he says. Uh, all right, I want to hear from our callers. Now, should the media be unbiased? Or, you know, <laughs> but anyways. <laughs> Because they have so much power. They're the number one radio station. You know, what they say is, is what people hear, and a lot of people believe. Yeah. And I don't blame them for believing it, because I used to believe it too. Because I thought these people were my friends, not employees of corporate Canada, which is what they really are. Yeah. So, all right, I want to hear from our callers. I want to hear from you, our audience, how you are feeling right now about PR. I've got to tell you, I have, I have concerns about us all agreeing we should leave first past the post. And then, once we cut ourselves loose and we are adrift, that we fight over which direction the ship should go in. And I'm worried that we might actually rip the ship apart doing that. So this is what CFAX is telling us about proportional representation. That's what I'm worried about. I am worried about giving up our safe harbor that we are in. In other words, a safe harbor control, because it's the easiest system for corporate Canada to control. It's their safe harbor. I'm worried about giving up our safe harbor that we are in, and that once we are out at sea, we decide whether we want to go north or south, whatever. We start fighting, and there are 15 hands on the wheel, and a mutiny happens. That is what I'm worried about. I want to hear from you, though. Quick break. We're back after this. Right. <sighs> so, I, I mean, this is like, um, sounds to me like a public relations firm. Is, they've been consulting with a PR firm. And they said, well, you know, the underlying thing, that the way to control people is through their fears. Uh, everybody knows that. You know, fear is a huge motivator for behavior. Uh, a lot of decisions get made because people are fearful of what might happen to them. So there's nothing rational about this. There's nothing, there's no way of examining proportional representation and look at the pros and cons. No, let's just go to this fear level and just scare people. Scare people away from proportional representation. Walter, that is very well said. You know, I, uh, yeah, I think you're, that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. Um, so I think the campaign against proportional representation is led by the people who have the power now and they don't intend to give any of it up. There's big money on the no side and we should all keep that in mind as this moves ahead. Yeah. Next. Well, I, I got a little beef and, and that is uh, uh, I see a lot of talk going on about uh, about whether we should amalgamate, the municipalities should amalgamate. It all sounds like a pretty good idea, makes things more efficient. We have 13 municipalities and all this expense and stuff. I don't agree with that, but... No, but, but that, that's yes. sort of the argument. And, and face value, a lot of people would buy into that. Um, but what I've... There's a whole lot of problems with it, but the one thing I want to say is this, is that they want amalgamation so we have more of a regional government, government in this area, in this region, so that they can make transportation uh, decisions and policing and all the other things that they want to do. The thing is that we already have a body that does that, and that's called the Capital Regional District, the CRD. Now, the only problem with the CRD is that it's not elected. 
Well, I wouldn't say that's the only problem with the CRB. But the, but only, the big problem is that they're not elected. Now, you could argue that the mayors, uh, these people are councillors, and the mayors appoint them, and it's all this democracy is happening, but not really. The mayor gets to send their friends to the CRD. The CRD makes a decision like to build a sewage treatment plant. It's a billion-dollar decision. They didn't put it out to tender. They awarded it to their friends. They put it through the PPP system of uh, structure uh, for financing, which is basically taking any project and just it's doubling the cost. It's a P3? It's a public-private partnership? Public-private partner, public partnership Canada. And it's just a way for corporations to get their hooks into government. God help us. And it, it's so dark. But nobody's talking about no, that. No, of Nothing, course not. There's no discussion about the CRD floating around making these huge decisions. And uh, on, on the other hand, they want to talk about amalgamating a couple of municipalities to try to straighten this out. So the thing is, I think, for all the mayors in this region, don't do the shameful thing of sending people to the CRD. Just to say, no, we don't, we're not going to send anybody there because this is not a democratic institution. If you want to elect your, your uh, directors, that is wonderful. And I really think the model should be that the CRD should hold elections just like any other body, governing body. People run for election. You don't have to be a city councillor. You have no particular qualifications. Most of these councillors don't have any qualifications anyway. Uh, and they could just run it as a regional government and elect it entity, and we'd have a little more democracy in this country. Well, I don't, I don't disagree with you, except from what I see, even when we do elect them. I mean, look at our city council, look at our provincial government, look at the federal government. Yeah. There's no democracy anyways. So there's, something else has got to change. No, no doubt. But this is a start. It's like okay, a I'm, I'm happy to go with that. Sure, and not? by the way, use a proportional representation model to elect these directors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and write it into the that. rules that they have to do what the public wants. I mean, shouldn't that be the rules somewhere? They have to well, do what the public wants. Well, they don't get elected wants. again. I mean, this is the fair. I know, but then the thing. next, but it never changes. They keep getting unelected and reelected or whatever. Yeah, and it doesn't change. Well, I mean, we have to we have to work that out too. God. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So what else you got, Jack? Uh, well, what have I got here? Climate change. Today is uh, Wednesday, October the 10th, so Hurricane Michael is just uh, hitting um, uh, Florida. North Carolina and South Carolina were devastated uh, over the last two or three weeks by Hurricane Florence. It's been completely pushed out of the media as if it never happened. I'm absolutely shocked that the media is so powerful that even within the United States, two states can yeah. be just hammered. And you never hear a word about it. It's like it didn't happen. I don't know what's happening with those people. There's massive pollution. Yeah. There were six nuclear power plants in the area. They had like a meter of rain. You don't get a meter of rain in the yeah. continental United States. That's, it comes in, uh, in monsoon countries maybe. Yeah. And, and it's gone. And now Florida, and and also today, um, the Dow went down 800 points. So they may be starting to bring that down as well. You know, uh, God help us. They, they've got plans for us that you know. We at may not at like. a certain point, uh, we'll be seeing an exodus from those low, low lying areas because that's only going to be, become worse. And then we get into all sorts of discussions about where people are going to go. Like Bangladesh is about three feet above sea level. Uh, I think we got 40, 000, 40 million people in Bangladesh. They farm that land. That's, their subs that's how they subsist. Uh, is anybody talking about that and how we're going to deal with that? Like these are issues that if they're not planned and taken care of, can erupt into huge uh, unrest and well, it looks like a lot of suffering. That seems to be where we've been taken, because all of this is completely unnecessary. Um, and it's not only the climate change, it's the pollution in general. We're all polluted yeah. by this crazy corporate industrial lifestyle, or in corporate industrial, I guess, lifestyle that we're forced to live in. I mean, does yeah. anybody ever ask us if we want any of it or part yeah. of it? I mean, I, I don't think, you know, I mean, wouldn't we rather have more public transportation if we could actually vote and make good stuff happen? 
Yeah. But that's not even an option on the table. So they build cities. I mean, yeah. North America used to have very, very, very good tram, which is railways. Yeah. Uh, all, all of our towns and cities, and they were bought up and destroyed by the oil industry, the gas industry, and, and a, few, a few other, the banks, I'm sure. Yeah. And look what they've given us, which is destroying the entire planet. They don't care. Yeah, well, we have to supply a lot more uh, fossil fuels. Why don't we touch on um, the LNG development in the north? I mean, the thing is that what's happened there is uh, uh, John Horgan has always been uh, the hero for this issue, and now they have this $40 billion uh, investment, the uh, private investment, the so-called. And uh, now we're going ahead with uh, opening up all of northern BC uh, for all the fracking to be all that uh, gas be extracted uh, and they're going to bring it to Kitimat and they put them in these big LNG uh, ships. Now that is like a nuclear weapon floating on the water. When one of those, if one of those were to explode, uh, if it was near a city it would destroy, like it could destroy Vancouver. It, the, the, if it, it actually leaked to that extent and then exploded. Uh, if you look at um, Kitimat and you look at the narrows, the tiny bit of water that they're supposed to navigate, I mean, you really have to wonder, if you know, how safe is this? And I'd say that is less of a danger than the fracking, which is the poisoning of yeah. massive amounts of our fresh water in order to inject it with filled with chemicals into the ground and blast apart the rocks yeah. to free the gas that leaks everywhere and creates massive pollution. And, no, and they don't care. I mean, the NDP is right behind it 100%. And I think, I think going the to media. Kitimat, I think uh, a lot of that frac gas is going back to the tar sands. But there's been reports on that. Yes, right now, the, the fracking that is done in British Columbia, a lot of it, or maybe all of it, I don't know, but at least yeah. a lot of it is used uh, to power and do other things within the tar sands. Yeah. So uh, it's ahead. quite hypocritical, I think, of uh, the government to claim that they're opposed to the oil sands while they're selling <laughs> natural the gas. The whole story, to them. it's like, it, it's all phony. You know, yeah. I, I no longer, I mean, I was, I believed all of it my whole life, but I no longer believe even one word of it. I just think it's all a pack of lies. We don't even, I mean, the real story is what's happening in, with climate change and yeah. other environmental disasters. But that's pushed aside and we're told, well, LNG, it's going to make us all rich yeah. and dead, but they don't mention that. It's crazy. Yeah, and we, sure. we have no ability to push back. No. We're slaves. You got another one for us, Jack? Maybe we have one more before we wrap up. Next on the list is uh, homeless issue. The banks. Maybe we should just leave it at that. We, we got some more things we want to talk about. And of course, we're going to have Will Smith on later to talk about a new book on 9-11. Uh, and look at the power structures behind the creation of 9-11 and how we're still living under the same people that are in power today that, that uh, have been around since the Kennedy assassination and earlier and, and the connections between all that, those groups. So anyway, let's uh, wrap the segment up. If you're going to wrap now. it up, I'm going to say one word about homelessness. Okay. Uh, to me, I think homelessness has been deliberately created by the people who run our country homelessness and high house prices and high rents are Canada's national housing policy. Yeah. That's, what's, that's what it's set up to do. High prices, high rents, and homelessness because to get the high prices and high rents, you have to have a uh, shortage. And so the yeah. people at the bottom are homeless. And the rest of us have to pay more and more and more and more and more. It's crazy, but that's our country. A very good point. Anyway, so that wraps up the, the segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. It is Wednesday, October the 10th. I'd like to start by thanking the volunteer crew and Shaw staff that makes this program happen every couple of weeks. And uh, my guest in this segment is Mackenzie Orcherton, who actually is also one of the volunteers here who helps do the show. Yeah. Um, and we're going to be talking about um, vapid municipal politics. Yeah. And I asked you what vapid meant, and uh, you said it meant shallow. Shallow, so. uh, trivial, pointless, uh, 
busy work, you know, a lot of that sort of stuff. I think, uh, I think a lot of, and this isn't unique to Victoria or anything, but I think we might be like a particularly bad case of it, perhaps. But uh, that like a lot of municipal or local politics gets kind of obsessed with trivialities in the cities where we live. Uh, that uh, in the case of Victoria, for instance, we are facing uh, a fentanyl crisis and the worst housing crisis in the history of the city. And I would say without really, without fear of being contradicted, I would say that people in this munip municipal election seem to care more about bike lanes than they do about housing or fentanyl. And that's really bizarre to me that like, the politics in this city have become so insular and petty that uh, we've sort of become totally focused on personalities and, and uh, like I said, trivial things to the point where a crisis that in which hundreds of people are dying can just sort of pass us by without really anything more than just a, a couple of words. Well, I, I don't think the those things are trivial because to a lot of people they're not because those issues have been played up you know especially in the media I think they talk about the bike lanes a lot and yeah and and they but but there is that problem that why like a lot of people say why aren't the bike lanes for example on view or why wasn't there a process you know that's it uh, yeah. to, uh, to yeah. find out what we want and do it well that's fine I mean you know I could just just to dive into the thing I said doesn't matter very much. Yeah, uh, yeah the bike lanes, could be, could, bike lanes could have been put anywhere better or they could have been done in a better way. Yeah. But as far as I'm concerned, they're not destroying the city. They're not destroying downtown. They're not going to ruin the character of Victoria. If anything is, it's going to be housing, fentanyl, homelessness, yes. the actual problems we're facing. Yes. The reason why there are empty storefronts downtown isn't because of bike lanes. It's because of like real big economic problems that the city's facing and who wants to shop downtown yeah know? well that that too been, because really that's a you know how did our down why why did that happen to our downtown uh, well i think it's mostly to do with just uh, the cost of rent the fact that updating and upgrading those buildings is expensive a lot of people again have a very i guess uh nostalgic attitude towards some of these very old beautiful for the most part buildings but they're also you know going to fall down in an earthquake so they you can either knock them down, which people will protest and be opposed to, or you can leave them as they are, and they're really not good for any kind of modern business to operate in. Like the electrical is terrible, so you can't have like a tech company in most of these places because you can't set up the computers for it, or the plumbing's terrible, so you can't really do the things that a modern economy would really be asking for. And so people just get, you know, if you want office space, you can just go into, you know, Central Sandwich. It's way cheaper. Uh, you'll get better you know, uh, access to water, electricity, parking. And so downtown is sort of just evaporated as a place to go to for any reason. Uh, the other impact that the housing crisis has had is that there's very little live music downtown anymore. The culture of this city is kind of just eroding away as there's just become this whole uh, envir an environment in which a kind of, uh, you know, Airbnb attitude towards what this city is supposed to look like as if this, you know, as if the purpose of Victoria is to have a nice skyline or to be something that you can look at on a postcard, as opposed to a city in which people actually live and work. Uh, and I think that, 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 that idea that this is a place where people live, regardless of all of the niceties of like, you know, uh, cobblestone streets and stuff, that's the part, that, that's what I would want to see anyone focusing on when it comes to, you know, municipal politics. Not heritage buildings, but people. Yeah, and I think that that's unfortunately that that the other side of things is where people have, broadly speaking, kind of become a bit I, I think gone a bit crazy over, for the most part. Uh, if a building is something that in an earthquake people would die because it will fall down, then that building should either be replaced or basically gutted. Period. I don't think people should be working or living in buildings that will collapse in an earthquake. But since those buildings are beautiful, there is always this opposition to change. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I look, I look at city politics, and to me, it's just, it, it's, it's. To me, the problem is the city council has the power, the public has no power, and we're completely disconnected. 
that to me is the yeah. fundamental, one of the fundamental problems. And the, and the only way we uh, have, a, have a sense that we have any kind of power over our elected local officials, who in theory are supposed to be like the most democratic, the most local, the person you can like get physical access yeah, yeah. to, we to know talk them. to. We yeah, know them. But, but it doesn't it, doesn't it seems, if anything, to be less appealing to people. I think there's a reason why municipal elections have, generally speaking, the lowest voter turnout compared to provincial or federal, because people may know these people, they may have personal feelings about it, but there is a real disconnect on a political level as far as what the municipal government does, because in many cases, the only way we have to really interact with these people is at public consultations where, let's face it, most of that stuff is just about getting, allowing the public to just blow off steam and yell at a city official or, or you know, some, some candidate or whoever and just and tell them. And get misinformed by those well, city officials. And just tell them like, you know, you're screwing up, you're not doing your job, yeah. and then go home. And then they just go back to city hall or wherever and just do the job they were gonna do anyway. And, you know, while it's fun to yell at people, <laughs> it's not, it's not, there's no, there, there's no depth of politics. There's no real robust political culture in this city. It is petty and in some cases vindictive. Uh, and I don't like that at all. And I think it's entirely possible that we can have a political culture in Victoria that is actually geared towards principles and ideas and not just whether or not you don't like the current mayor. So. I think I'd like to see something like that. How, how do we build that? Um, I think, and this is going to kind of sound a bit contradictory perhaps, but I think that there needs to be an appeal to bigger ideas. And the problem, like, as in ideas that go beyond just our local neighborhood or community or city. Uh, and the reason is because those bigger ideas are the ones that won't get mired in personality politics. If we start talking about things like how do we build enough affordable housing so that everyone has it, right? And you know what, I'll just, I'll just throw Things in like there. That. It doesn't even, I mean, what should be getting built is just good housing for yeah. people to live in. We shouldn't be calling it affordable, which well, almost is a demeaning term, but I, why I, can't we build good housing for the people who live here? I, I'm fine with that too, Thanks. good housing. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, everyone you know, has a right to a home and all that. Uh, but. I think that, that we need to be going after big ideas, which do inspire people, do get people interested in politics, because at a municipal level, unfortunately, and this is true of every city to some extent, but especially Greater Victoria, where we have so many little municipalities, uh, each and every mayor kind of is, is a bit powerless and helpless with these large crises that we're facing. And so there isn't really a, a way within the context of pure municipal politics to really get people interested in this stuff. Because I have we a say, way. Oh, you do? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. More democracy. I am totally in favor of democracy. I, think, I, I, I don't think there's a situation where we shouldn't have more democracy, to be honest. Um, I know everyone sort of goes, yeah, but what about you know, this, that, and the other sort of example of like bad things that happen? And I would say there's, there's no... Uh, politicians will, uh, particularly mayors, will always tell us about whether this or that idea or principle or action is or isn't Victoria. But unless we're able to decide that ourselves, we don't actually know what this city is, like what we want it to be, is generally just dictated to us and we either believe them or not. Uh, so I think, yeah, anything that, anything that improves democracy, anything that improves uh, actual decision making on the part of the public is a good thing. Uh, I am, I'm against uh, informal or like just consultative activity that uh, where you know you ask the public, we say what we think, and then nothing happens. I mean, we've been doing that for decades on a bunch a of different disgrace. issues. It's a disgrace. You go to these open houses that yeah. the city or the CRD put on, it's, a di it's an insult to democracy. Yeah, the, the, uh, my whole, I'm, I'm 32 years old, and this city has been arguing about sewage treatment my entire life. And so whatever the process is now, whatever consultation is, I think we've had more than enough of it. That, that kind of consultation. That that's kind just, of, yes. Just, yes. But we that, had no real consultation. Well, no, no real no. actual like, democratic process yes, by yes, which we can just yes. decide what we yes. want to do. I took part in the most recent consultation for which Lisa Helps was the chairwoman. And we were told going in that this was going to be a democratic process you know, a public process to find out what the public wanted. And I 
actually thought maybe that's true. Some other people told me from the beginning that it wasn't true, and they were right. The whole thing was a complete farce. We, the people who attended, were completely manipulated, and it was run from above. And they got the answers they wanted because those were the only answers that were allowed. And so the process was, and we ended up with something that probably none of us wanted, but, but the power structure wanted it from the beginning, which is a billion dollar system that does nothing for the environment. That's what we got. Well, I, I mean, uh, yeah, I, don't, the, the, I, I suppose the good news for you <laughs> is that we'll probably do the classic Victoria thing and kick it down the road again. You know. It's too late, it's being built. Oh, yeah, so. but come on, we can always stop. We, well, we could stop. We could just we could waste stop. a bunch of money yeah, halfway yeah, yeah, and yeah, then just yeah, try yeah, again. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's one of those things where it's, I think, it, I, I'm trying to just say that I think there is a better way and we can actually uh, build like a democratic process in this city and in a, any city, really, that can actually make decisions. I think the public is no better or rather no worse and possibly better at making decisions than most of the elected fi officials in Greater Victoria. And we have a lot of them. Uh, the, there isn't really any real need to do it this way because like on the one hand, yeah, it's great for blowing off steam, but most people aren't even involved in the consultation process anyway. I mean, a lot of this stuff just passes people well, I'll by. Give, I'll give you an example of, I think, what you're saying. Yeah. For example, with, uh, with the Blue Bridge, if our city council had come to us and said, do you want us to lie to you about this whole process? I think most of us would say, no, we don't want you to lie to us. But in the end, that's basically what they did. They told us that building a new bridge would be cheaper than fixing the old bridge, but the old bridge repair cost was under $10 million. Well, that, I and mean, that was yeah. kept secret from us, and they all pretended it didn't exist. So. Let's let you know. I think I'm saying what you're saying. That kind of. I mean, in the case of the Blue Bridge, I do think that we would have, um, ha ha to a certain extent, had the city not tricked us, uh, we would probably be consulting over rebuild. Like, we, at this moment, I expect we would probably be consulting over rebuilding the wreckage of the Blue Bridge after it collapsed. We wouldn't have repaired it because you know we don't want to spend the money, and we wouldn't have built a new one. Uh, if anything. You know, we would have consulted until it collapsed and then spent six months consulting over who should pay for the cleanup. Like, that's the problem with the process as it exists now. Now, on any specific issue, I know you and me, we disagree on a lot of these, like, specifically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it doesn't matter. What do people but, yeah, think? Yeah, I, I think a decision needs to be made in a democratic way. Now, if I end up on the wrong side of that or whatever, I'm like, oh, okay, fine. Like, maybe the Blue Bridge could have just been repaired and it would have been cheaper. Yeah. At this point, it's... It, we're, we're done like that's no longer much of an issue but that's it's the process that needs to change the, and the, the fact is I think the process has sort of evolved into the system in which everyone can take the credit and no one gets the blame for anything so that every whenever anything good happens or a change occurs every, like the bridge you know all the good it's a new bridge isn't this great it's better for Victoria Anyone, anyone even remotely associated with that decision can claim total credit for it. And all the bad stuff, well, you can blame that on other people. And I think there's a similar sort of attitude uh, amongst the cities in Greater Victoria that when it comes, again, to you know, the crisis with fentanyl or housing, there is, a, there is an easy ability for all of them to blame each other for not providing that housing or not doing enough to deal with fentanyl. Okay. Mackenzie, we're out of time. We're going to continue this conversation Definitely. after the election, which is coming up. And I guess, uh, yeah, by the time this starts yeah. to air. Thank you very much, Mackenzie. Very interesting. I'm glad we agree on democracy. Yes. And thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. Um, it is Wednesday, October the 10th. My guest in this segment is Rick Habgood. And we're going to be talking about proportional representation. Um, in my opinion, uh, it's the 1% who are opposed and as well the Liberal Party uh, leadership is completely opposed. Um, so what are the Liberals doing on proportional representation? Well, the Liberals actually have five issues. One of them is local representation. They're saying that Proportional, represents, report, proportional representation will take away local representation. I would okay. disagree with That's that. That's number one. Yeah. Number two, they say that 
PR, pro-rep, will produce unstable governments and will create a situation where there's going to be a lot more elections than it would be with first past the poach, pro, uh, post. And that's not really the case either? And that's not the case either. Absolutely not. Like, uh, and also the extremist groups. Right. It's going to let in extremist groups. Can I say that something? We okay. are going to be basically overrun by far, far right-wing people that are going to wind up uh, controlling everything in, in BC and it's going to be a mess. Okay. I just want to throw something in. I think our current voting system allows a real right-wing radical group to control everything, which is the 1%, because they control the whole system, that's why they like it. Okay? Yeah. So that's so much for the extremists. Yes, that's right. Well, you know, I mean, they create the extremist groups. And they do that too, yes. So the other part is, the, the fourth one is that the referendum process, as put forward by David Eby, the Attorney General, and um, the legislation that was created within the legislature is unfair. Is unfair. Well, I completely disagree with that. But So, anyways, those are four points that they're going to hammer out over the next month, month and a half. Now, there is five issues, though, for the Liberals. And the fifth issue is actually the biggest one, but they never talk about. It. And that's that with proportional representation, that will take away their power. Mm. They have been in power for a long, long time. Social Democratic parties have won four elections since 1933. Since almost 100 years. We're getting on there. Yes, we're getting on there. Four elections. That's it. The right wing has, had, has been in control in between those four elections. Yeah. And I'm including this election, I'm including this government, because even though they didn't win the popular vote, they didn't actually win uh, in, in a first-past-the-post sense, they did through a coalition with the Green Party. Yeah. So what, what we're saying is if you hear anything from the no side, whatever it is, you can almost be certain that is that it's an extremist point of view. And what uh, we have is a website that you can go to. It's called prorepfactcheck.ca. Prorep fact check check dot ca. So. Please go to that website if you have any question whatsoever, if you hear something, if you read something that just sounds really bizarre, that website is your, is your uh, answer for, for the questions that you have. Okay, so now, and always question whatever the no site is pointing out. It's unfortunate. Uh, we, we, want to, we would love to have a debate that is factual, that is um, fact-based, but that's not happening. The, the no side continues to put out rhetoric that is absolutely uh, a lie, untrue, and it's not even worth debating. It's unfortunate. But they don't want to lose, because if they lose, they lose their power. Because the way that it works, the way that it has worked in the past, is that if you get 40% of the vote, you normally get 100% of the power. It's unusual, but that's how first past the post work. It's not fair. What we're saying, the people who support PR, pro-rep, is that if you get 40% of the vote, you should only get 40% of the seats. No more, no less. That's rational, and it's a good starting point for a democracy, because all of a sudden, we have inclusiveness. Anyways, let's move on. It is, it is I mean, it is, I, I, of course, if you get 40% of the vote. But from the voters' point of view, if, I mean, why should the party that gets only 40% of the vote get all the power? It's crazy. The rest of us, the other 60%, the majority, are out in the cold. You know what? 
It's not democratic. Yeah. It's as simple as that. You know, in a democracy, one of the golden rules of democracy is that majority rules. Now, how can 40% control 100%? It just doesn't make any sense. Also, you know, another problem with first past the post is that when they do get that 40% and when they do get that 100% um, of the power, the 60% that didn't vote for them have zero say in anything. They have zero power. Anyways, there's a, there was um, uh, a poll that was taken just a little while ago. And what it showed is that the, the people that, that supported PR that were under 35, they supported it by 70%. So the under 35 year olds support proportional representation by 70%. Now, the over 55s crowd supported first past the post. What's wrong with us? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, we just like the way things are going and why, why rock the boat? So anyways, Both an, sinking. An, overwhelming, an overwhelming majority of young people want to change the voting system, all right? So smart. So 10 decided voters under 35. Seven and 10 decided voters under 35 support proportional representation. The opposite is true of older British Columbians. Among decided voters, 55 and older, first past the polls holds a commanding lead over proportional representation. So um, what this says to me is that we got to get the youth vote out. We got to get young people engaged in this uh, referendum. If we're to win, we need the young vote. We need to get those under 35 out. We need you guys to, to sign the ballots, yes to PR. So that's something that uh, we have to do. Now, another issue, of course, is the voting systems. And there has been uh, a lot of confusion about, uh, number one, there's going to be two questions on the ballot. One question is going to be whether or not you support first past the post, 100% of the power on 40% of the vote, or you support proportional representation which is 40% of the power on 40% of the vote. That's rational to me. So that's the first question. Do you, use, do you support a majoritarian government where that one particular government has 100% of the power or do you support the 40%? Okay. And then there's the second question. And the second question now is there are three voting options that are going to be on the ballot, three of them. There's one is going to be dual member proportional. The other one is going to be mixed member proportional. And the other one is going to be rural urban. OK, now that question, and I want to underline this, is optional. There's a lot of people who just don't care about voting systems. They do care about uh, uh, what happens in their lives as far as health care goes, education, you name it, they definitely care about that. Uh, housing. So they do want a different form of government that's going to give them a better outcome. So they, that's what they may vote for proportional representation, but they don't know which of the three but systems. They, don't, want to, they yeah. don't have to vote for that. Exactly. They can just leave that blank. Optional. Yes. So we got we to gotta underline that. But so, all three systems will give you your own directly elected MLA, exactly. just as we have now, except there will be fewer of them. So the directly, we will, we will still have our own directly elected, and they're all proportional. So 10% of the votes means 10% of the seats. 40% of the votes means 40% of the seats. It doesn't mean 100% of the power. Exactly. That's why I support it, because it's more democratic. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's why I support it. And I don't think there's any question that it is proportional representation is a better voting system for us, the people, than our current first-past-the-post system. 
the no side is funded by, I think, the 1%. And they have a lot of money that they're throwing into this. And they're going to pretend they care about you and your interests, but they don't. What they want is to maintain their power. And with First Past the Post, it's easier for them to keep their power. And that's why uh, so many things are going bad in, in, in our country. It's a, it's a very tough, ugly situation when you have all that power concentrated in one office. Yeah. That, that should never happen. And we need to make other changes as well so the politicians work more for us. But That's right. First past the, uh, but changing our voting system is a big, big, big first step. Now, the new government in Quebec has said they're going to bring in a proportional voting system. Hey, what do you know? They might beat us to the punch. I hope, I hope they do. Yeah. You know, I think that uh, Quebec would be a great example, and I think that I don't know. I, I really haven't ha had that much time to really study the Quebec situation, New Brunswick also, and P PEI. So I it's feel that there's this groundswell that's happening in Canada right now, and I think that as as the the younger generation become older they become wiser. And I think they're, I mean, when I was like 20, 25 years old, I had no idea about a voting system, to be quite honest with you. And now the 25 year olds, the 30 year olds, a, a lot of them are hip, hip to what's yes. going on. And they want change. Who would have ever thought that the voting system is I so know. important I in know. the democracy of your country? That thought never entered my mind. Uh, except, you know, lots of people have been pushing it, and so it finally did. A number of years ago, I started to see the light. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. So we got to get out the vote. Number one, we got to get the youth vote out. So if you're watching this show, or if you have a, a son or daughter, get them involved. Make sure that they sign the ballot, because we need their vote. we we got to win this. So... Yeah. Definitely young voters and don't believe anything you hear from the no side. I can't say that uh, it would be nice to, to say, and well, don't trust don't, the yes, don't believe don't everything trust, you hear, yeah. but don't, don't believe anything. And don't trust the yes side either, you know. Uh, every, everything should be questioned. Everything should be accurate. Um, the website prorepfactcheck.ca. Yes. ProRepFactCheck.ca. It's a great, great website. Yeah, now it's coming from our side of the uh, equation, it so it should be looked at, uh, you know, as that. But, but still, it, it's there, and these guys are people with reputations, and they're, you know, for factual questions, they will give as best they can factual That's answers. That's right. Because um, the rest of us, you know, people don't know that much, because it's the whole, I mean, the issue has been downplayed in the media in terms of what's what. I Rick, know. thank you very much. I think we're out of time. Is Sandy waving his hand? Yes, he is. Thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum and vote for PR. Welcome back to Citizens Forum. I have with me today Will Smith, and Will's our director and uh, all-around handy guy uh, that, that makes the show happen every two weeks. And Will's uh, come in with a book uh, that... Uh, He's just received, it's just fresh off the press. It's called 9-11 on Masks. And uh, I just briefly looked it over and it looks like a very excellent and very factual account of the events of September 11, 2001. And uh, something that we, I think we should all look at. Now the authors are David Ray Griffin who wrote several great books uh, on 9-11, also on the Kennedy assassination, mm. uh, uh, the JFK assassination. And Elizabeth Woodward, who's a local researcher and author here in Victoria, and uh, they have done excellent work here with just basically tabulating the facts around this issue. Okay, welcome to the show, Well, Thank now, you. It's now, always great to be here. The first thing I'd like to ask you, like, you know, September 11th, 2001, <laughs> this is September or October, 2018 so we're getting along we're 17 years uh, or so past this event why do you think it's so important that people still remain interested and maybe read a book like this 
Well, essentially, the, the thing is, is that we've been gaslighted for uh, 17 years. So at some point, you have to understand that the, the uh, official story for 9-11 is nonsense. So and the gaslighting, how does that, what's the context Well, our government's lying, lying to us and never telling us that they're not lying to us. So right. the whole thing is that, I mean, this book goes through, the format of this book is that it's a, uh, it shows, it has sections or contents and it has a, each particular topic is covered in detail. So it's the, the official explanation is covered and then there will be uh, explanations, alternative explanations. And these are the people, it's a panel of people. Yeah. I'm not gonna go into the book uh, too much right now because I haven't even finished it yet and my yeah. wife keeps stealing it from me and I, <laughs> I see her over there and, and uh, she mutters to herself and then smoke comes out of her ears a little bit and then she goes on. <laughs> but uh, no, I think it's important because we're all pretending that everything's just fine and everything's working and you know we're beginning to see the wheels come off and, uh, but, but at the same time we're still essentially pretending that, uh, that things are, are okay and that we know what's so. And I think it's also important to realize that everybody has a story about why, why they do things. Yeah. I was, my wife and I were watching a, um, an episode of Father Brown, for example, yeah. on TV. And I bring it up because I think it has a really important point. George Bush has some story in his mind about 9-11 and why it was yeah. important for it to go down the way it did. And I don't know what it is, but I can imagine that it was, well, the reason I bring up the Father Brown is because he, it was a story about a flashback to a, a murder that occurred in World War I. Yeah. And the, the soldier shot somebody who wasn't going along with the plan. And the plan was going to involve the killing of several, uh, many other uh, innocent soldiers. But in his mind, that needed to happen to save the, the rest of the troops. Yeah. And so there was this, there was this thing of the greater good. So yeah. somebody can justify pulling the trigger and killing a lot of people by saying, well, I'm saving, by doing this, I'm saving a million people from being killed. Yeah. But really, we can all see that this isn't the real story. So we, ha we all have to get some kind of a story in our head that is not a lie. And yeah. I think it's really important for each of us to, it, it doesn't matter if the story is perfect, but it has to be better than these people that the, the whole United States uh, military system stood down and these primitive people from caves in Afghanistan did the, the trade tower. I, I just, I think it's absolutely yeah. important. I mean, it's been important for my own mental health to uh, to understand these things. But you see, then it has then it has a lot of repercussions. Is who's who's running this show? And if I'm if if uh, if I'm live in the United States and I'm a, a Republican, and uh, the Republican Party is doing all these things, is this really representative of how of how I feel? And I, I think that all of us have to have to get out of an abusive relationship there. It doesn't matter what, what, uh, what party you're in, really. It's just, instead of, instead of giving these faulty stories that are, yeah. that are just allowing us to do horrible things that, that uh, we need to get out of that mode. So this, is a, this can be a big help. And the way I found yeah. out about this, Elizabeth has been on the show before, right. if you remember, and uh, she, sent, she put a, posted something in my timeline on Facebook about this. And so I, I uh, went and had, my wife and I had a coffee with her, and she gave us a copy to, to read. So, uh, but anyway, I tried to order another copy, and it's already sold out on Amazon. That's so fantastic. they've gone through the first printing, and they're going to have more available yeah. in November. And I think uh, we'll get Elizabeth back on the show, and I'd like her to really explain yeah. the whole book. But as you pointed out, there's a, a pretty good uh, sentence in the back, so I'll just... Um, well, I, I, I cheated in that. I looked at the last well, that's page. That's a good way to start reading the book. I often read in the back. The most faithful example of fake news in the 21st century thus far has been the official account of 9-11. It is long past the time to set the story straight. So I think that, that all of us could, uh, you know, some people, uh, you don't have to know everything about it, but you yeah. do have to know some substantive factual information about what, yeah. what, was going, what went on there create a confusion and nobody really knew what the heck was going on you know
Well, yeah, I have a, I have a hard time watching any of that stuff anymore because it's just how do you how do you sort out what's true and what's false? And and really, I mean, I I, I mean, I have a different you know what I I'm yeah. more into the the whole uh, part of consciousness. I think this whole thing is about a huge shift in consciousness. Yeah. And so what I see is that there are a lot of people who are trying to hold on to where we are and we're trying to keep them yeah. keep us from going somewhere else. What we really need to do is just uh, let every person act for themselves and let because everybody people people know what to do you you know yeah. people know there are a lot of people for example who are are building alternative housing they're building uh, you know houses that don't need uh, outside energy and that yeah. are completely sustainable we think that the democratic elites and the republican elites are getting their talking uh, uh, orders from the same public relation firms, all of whom are saying, no, we're going to stay on top. The, the banksters are going to continue controlling the economy. It doesn't matter what the, the real economy is all about in the United States, which there isn't any because they can never pay their debts. So if you actually ask the Americans to pay off their debts, their, their economy would go totally flat because they don't have the money. So they're, but they're pretending they're pretending there's economy there. Yeah. And as long as we have, they have their boy there, uh, Trump, to do all that dancing and all that nonsense, uh, they can go on with their, their real agenda, which is to continue on with warfare and destabilization and control of economies and stuff like that. So uh, to me, we have to dig in to this issue to try to fit it together in a way that makes sense in our lives now. And, and it's not, this is not old history. You know, the same people are involved. The same names keep popping up. You know. Yes, that's true. I, I, that's a, <laughs> another thing that I'm amazed at, you know, in my own transformation of consciousness. I was watching a video made by Jacques Vallée, who's a UFO expert. You might, he's yeah. the French guy that one portrayed in uh, what is that? Uh, that uh, close encounters of the third oh. kind. He's he's portrayed. Okay. In that. he's not in the movie. Understand? Yeah. He's portrayed as the yeah. French scientist. But anyway, I was amazed back in the early '70s when I was graduating from high school. Jacques Vallée was doing inquiry. He worked for a, a company. It's actually a private enterprise. I think it was a, an offshoot of Stanford University. And they were solving problems, very high-tech problems for companies. But they were also working on consciousness and uh -huh. UFOs and social media. Now, that's one of the most interesting yeah. things to me because here it is, 1973. That's 40-some years ago. And they knew about social media way back then. And they were experimenting on people. And we're, we're, and we're going through that again right now. I yeah. mean, they're a, but, but the papers, the original working papers, are way back then, and it's involved with consciousness and UFOs, which are primarily yeah. a, a, consci a, yeah. a consciousness. And Jack Vallée says that that it's primarily yeah. they have to do with with consciousness, not not so much as the physical things. So this to me is a real. You know, see, I, I, ha I find that I've lived my whole life not seeing the world the way I should be seeing yeah. it because I. Well, I read the newspapers and I went to church and I, you know, I did all the regular things. And now I got to go back and restructure that whole thing to where I am now. Yeah, I, I was, and this is helpful for that because yeah. at least, you know, at least we can we can see that the people in government do are not working for our general benefit. Yeah. And so if we pull it, if we pull ourselves back down, I have no control over anything. I feel like I have no control over anything that's happening on the world scene, right? I can try to understand it, but as far as actually controlling it, I'm, I'm just going to stay in this, in this uh, local field here and not worry too much about those guys because I don't like anything that's going on out there. And I don't believe that I don't believe the stories. So rather than subject my own consciousness yeah. to all that stuff, I'm just going to pull in and hear, and I'm going to worry about things like uh, the local politicians, uh, growing young farmers, things like that. So the next generation yeah. of kids knows how to grow food. And, you know, I'd like to see some, some things like the, the government maybe set aside some, like what they're doing in Russia, where they say, well, if you work this land, you can have this land yeah. and all the produce off of it. And there, there's, there's some movement towards that. I think there's an agricultural land reserve up in 
uh, in the middle, uh, up by, I don't know where it is exactly, yeah. maybe, where's that place where there are goats on the roof? Oh, uh, Coombs. Coombs, yeah, yeah, up there, maybe yeah. around there or something, I was reading about it. And see, that would be a good thing if people could actually grow their own food, because 50% of the food in Russia is organic and grown by yeah. people, just people who go there on the weekend, and they have a really short growing season. Yeah. So, you know, these are the things, I think if we can take the focus off the big mess out there and go down into the, to the local things, we're all going to be a whole lot better because yeah. we're just pawns and we're taxpayers to them. We're not people. The, the ability to step back uh, from anything that you're witnessing, and particularly in the mass media, uh, I've been protecting myself from, from the Donald Trump phenomenon. I don't Me follow, too. I've been following it on a daily basis. I got sucked in on the Brett Kavanaugh episode. I did for a while, but, but not, you know, not bad. I found myself like, why am I watching this? You right. Know? Uh, and you are subjecting yourself to it. I mean, yeah. you can, if, you, if yeah. you stop and close your eyes and feel your body, what's going on here right now? It's, yeah. There's some tension in there, let me tell you. <laughs> well, it, you really feel disheartened. Yeah. Uh, you really feel like, yeah, here we go. We're stacking the, that uh, Supreme Court with some pretty uh, yeah. I serious can't even I can't even comment <laughs> on that. But uh, but you anyway. <laughs> so you know the thing is, is that we do have to protect ourselves and try to always think in, in a bigger picture. I think. Yes. And just try to be able to remove yourself and step back. And it is not like uh, you don't care. But uh, you're caring more about the important things. That's no, like, you're caring. You're, you're not self-destructing. If, yeah. if you're not able to, you know, I mean, it's like sometimes you have to take a break. You can't go do something because you have to take a break or you won't ever be able to do it. You'll kill yourself. Yeah, exactly. So all of us have to be nice to ourselves and realize that we've been gaslighted, that we've been lied to, yeah. and that there are serious consequences to your own mental health yeah. if you don't fix that and understand and get the real story and have that ability to step back. So, so I'm just going to read that title again. It's, I'll uh, put it up on the... You'll put it up. So, yes. you know... 9-11 Unmasked, it's, it's a great book to have sitting on your coffee table. You don't have to try to read it all at one time. I, it'll make you mad if you read it. It'll, it'll really yeah, make but, you mad. But at least you're, you're, you have uh, facts that you can to, to digest and consider. And mm -hmm. it, it keeps you centered. It keeps you, you know, in, out in this world, uh, you wake up and I have a lot of uncertainty about what exactly do I know. So you have to always be reinforced with the facts and say, no, this is reality. This really did happen. And these people did pull this off. And we should not forget that because they're still around. Well, it'll be back in, in Amazon. Uh, the, I talked to uh, Elizabeth today, and she said it'll be back uh, in November. Yeah, so, so you can order you it can all You can order it. It's on uh, the Amazon. You, know, oh, you can get it. I think you can order it locally. or You can order it directly from the publisher, too. Yeah. I'll try to put that up. So. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming in, Will. Thank you. Uh, and that wraps up uh, Citizens Forum for this week.